Hi all, let's turn the Easton here with St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal Church here in Sacramento, California, where the Reverend Dr. Jason Thompson is our pastor. And we're continuing our Christian Development School lesson this week. We're continuing our Gospel Project study where we are doing a chronological study of the Bible, where we are looking at the storyline of the Bible, which is God's plan to redeem his people through his son, Jesus. And we've wrapped up the Old Testament. We've now moved into the New Testament and we're continuing in the Gospels. So our lesson this week, if you have your study guide, and that's okay if you don't, you can still follow along. Just grab your Bibles. The Bible is our textbook. We're continuing this week in The Savior is Followed, Unit 19, Session 5, beginning on page 48. So let me pray us in. Oh Lord God, we just praise you and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your gift of salvation. Lord God, Lord Jesus, you are King of Kings. You are our Savior. You are our Redeemer. Lord God, we praise you and thank you for your word in this lesson. Lord God, draw us into your word. Draw us to you. Lord God, cause us to know you more. Lord God, bring clarity um, through this lesson today. Lord God, speak to our hearts, minister to our hearts, and then um, show us how you would have us to respond. Lord God, we give you all the glory and all the praise. Amen. Okay, so our lesson again is the Savior is followed, and we're continuing from where we left off last week. Last week, we saw Jesus um, enter his ministry through the wilderness, and we looked at the temptations and how he became a model for us and how he responded to that temptation, all part of God's plan. Well, this week, we, John the Baptist, if you recall, John the Baptist, he introduced Jesus to the world as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And see, John the Baptist understood Jesus's role from the start. Jesus was the sacrificial substitute laying down his life for his people. Now, John, again, the following day, that's where we're at um, now, we're going to be back in the Gospel of John, he called Jesus the Lamb of God, and specifically telling two of his own disciples, allowing them to follow Jesus and become his disciples. Now, the call to follow the Lamb is the foundation of John's Gospel and the basis for the entire story of the Bible. See, from cover to cover, the Bible invites the reader to look at Jesus, to follow Jesus and to be saved. Now, the Jews in Jesus's day, they would have understood the imagery of the lamb. See, they would have known because lambs were used as sacrifice, especially during the Passover. And so the original audience would have understood the reference to the lamb as something pure and blameless. But what would have been difficult for them to understand, though, was a person being called the Lamb of God. I mean, how or why would a person step into the role of a sacrificial lamb? But even more, why would this description be used for someone who claimed to be sent from God to be the Messiah and the Savior? Well, our session in a sentence today on page 48 is Jesus invited his first followers into relationship with him and promised that they would experience great things. Jesus invited his first followers into relationship with him and promised that they would experience great things. And we're going to look at three aspects. We're going to look at the Messiah invites others to follow him. The Messiah reveals his identity by his power and the Messiah promises greater things to come. Well, let's just move right into our first point. The Messiah invites others to follow him. The Messiah invites others to follow him. We are going to be, if you want to follow along in your study guide, we're going to be on pages 54 and 55. Otherwise, please grab your Bibles, turn to chapter one, and we're going to be reading, I'm going to read for you verses 35 to 42. So I hope you have your Bibles and follow along. So John chapter one, verses 35 to 42. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. 
where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of God. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. That was John chapter one, verses 35 to 42. So here in this scene here, we see John with two of his disciples. And um, John himself was a disciple. And so he was a religious leader. So it was um, common in that day that the religious leaders would be surrounded by their disciples or their followers. And they were, you know, they wanted to understand the teachings of their religious leader, their master, and train themselves in that person's pattern of life. So John the Baptist as a religious leader and a prophet, he would have been one of such disciples. But we know that John's main mission was to point his disciples and his followers to Jesus. Now, here in our text, as he saw Jesus passing by, he says, look, Jesus, he says, Jesus, the Lamb of God. And the disciples started following Jesus around. Now, they were likely um, among those many people who were anxiously awaiting the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. So when John told them that the Messiah was here, the disciples listened. And then they got his attention. And when they got his attention, Jesus asked them what they wanted. He says, what, were you, what are you looking for? And, and notice the response here. So in verse 38 implies that they probably didn't fully grasp what was happening because they referred to Jesus here in the text as teacher, a rabbi, because they asked him, they said, where was he staying? Now, they may not have known at that point that who Jesus was or known, they may not have known all that Jesus was, but what they did know is that they wanted to follow him. And you know what? These are the first steps of discipleship. And Jesus responded. Jesus responded by inviting these strangers. He said, come and see. Jesus wanted them to experience him in a personal way. He says, come and see so that they could experience him in a personal way. Now, when people get close to Jesus, we see that he really was the Messiah. So when the people got close to Jesus, they saw that he was really the Messiah. And then in verses 40 to 42, Andrew is one of the first disciples mentioned here, and he was one of the two who pursued Jesus and went with Jesus. And then notice what he did. Now, it didn't take long for him to be clear that this was the Messiah. And then look what Andrew did. It says he went and got his own brother and brought him to Jesus. Now, there's three points here that I want to call your attention to. First, Andrew took what he knew and he told someone else. And then secondly, he went to his brother, someone that was close to him, um, so, and he brought him. He brought Simon to Jesus. And then thirdly, he followed the pattern that John started. And it was clear, so he followed the pattern. He pointed someone else to Jesus. So it was clear that Jesus is the Messiah, and he was serving as a messenger. Now, Jesus in turn, we notice here, he changed Simon's identity. He gave him a new name. And Simon changed as a result of his interaction with Jesus. Notice his transformation. He was transformed. Now, this serves as an example of all who are changed and transformed when they meet Jesus by faith, when they come into relationship with Jesus, when they come to know Jesus in a personal way. Now, discipleship includes following Jesus. It means staying near to him in response to his invitation to come and see, to come and to know him more. And discipleship includes sharing Jesus with others, bringing them to him so that they too can have a new identity in Christ Jesus. Now, we get to know Jesus by following him. And we also have the privilege of telling others about Jesus so they can follow him too. We have the privilege telling others, come and see this Jesus that I know. 
But we cannot know Jesus fully until we know that he is a Messiah with the power to save. Now that brings us to our second point here. The Messiah reveals his identity by his power. The Messiah reveals his identity by his power. And I'm going to read John chapter 1 verses 43 to 49 and you follow along in your Bible. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. That was John chapter 1, verses 43 to 49. Now we see here Jesus' invitation, his invitation, follow me. That's a common invitation that we see throughout the gospel. You know, the idea of following Jesus is kind of shorthand for repentance and faith that compels one to spend his or her life loving and serving Jesus. So that invitation to follow Jesus and you respond with repentance and faith, and then you want to spend your life loving and serving Jesus. And Christians or believers are often described as people who follow Jesus. They're followers of Christ. So when someone follows Jesus, there's also this um, kind of this natural evangelistic kind of impulse or component that also emerges. So we see here, Philip was, the text does say that Philip was from their town, okay? So maybe we can assume that the word had begun to spread through Andrew and Peter. And this is a pattern from one brother to another, and then throughout the city, it's a model for the movement of the gospel message that will continue beginning here in the gospels. And we're going to see this throughout the book, all the way through the book of Acts. You know, when one person comes to believe, then others soon follow in that same faith because you invite others to come and see this Jesus that I know. Now, after Philip heard the call, he believed and he chose to follow Jesus. And then he found Nathaniel and he makes a direct claim by saying that Jesus is the one to whom the law of Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament were pointing. Jesus is the long awaited Messiah. Now, Nathaniel here in verses 46 to 49, Nathaniel heard Philip testify of the Messiah's presence. But he found it kind of hard to wrap his, his mind around the fact that this Messiah was from such a, a place like Nazareth, right? Nazareth was small. Nazareth was off the beaten path. It was a working class community, and it gave no indication of being the type of place from which one would expect the Messiah to come. But what was a challenging statement was met with the familiar invitation. Philip said, come and see was how he responded to Nathaniel. And then this invitation given by Jesus was now extended by another on Jesus's behalf. Come and see this Jesus that I know. Now this type of invitation is the basis of our Christian witness. You know, believers, we don't have to feel there is no pressure to have to have all the answers. We don't have to have all the answers. We don't even have to be a Bible excerpt or anything like that. But we should be eager to invite people to investigate the claims of Jesus. We should be eager to invite people naturally to come and see this Jesus that I know. Now, they are invited to investigate this. And we see it's the same kind of thing in our churches too. You invite people to church so that they can witness firsthand the life transformation that God produces in and through his people. And then Jesus went and met Nathanael. And when Nathanael asked Jesus, he's like, how do you know me? This was a supernatural act of Jesus for Nathanael so that Nathanael could respond to the fact that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, which is how he responded. 
and he called him the son of God, the king of Israel. Nathaniel believed. Now let's pause for a moment and just talk about the calling of God to salvation. Now the calling of God to salvation happens in two ways. It happens externally through the proclamation of the gospel. So someone has shared the gospel, you've heard the gospel, you've heard about Jesus, and internally through the Holy Spirit, which works in the heart of the person who hears. And both of these callings are essential and they work together to bring someone to faith in Jesus. Now our faith in Jesus is dependent though on our understanding of who he is, namely the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of all, our Savior. Now, Jesus was God's anointed, and he pointed all who would listen to him to the great things that were to come in the future. And that's what we're going to look at next. And that brings us to our third and our final point. The Messiah promises greater things to come. The Messiah promises greater things to come. And follow along with me as I read John chapter 1, verses 50 and 51. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. That was John chapter one, verses 50 and 51. So now after Nathaniel's verbal declaration of faith that Jesus is the promised Messiah, Nathaniel believed, Jesus just asked his newfound disciple, just to consider the basis of his faith. He said, you know, he just asked, why did Nathaniel believe? Was it simply because Jesus said he saw him under the fig tree? So he's just asking Nathaniel to consider the basis of his faith. Now, Jesus here proclaims and he promises that his disciples, those who trust in him and follow him, that they're going to see the angels ascending and descending on him. So the focus here is um, not the angels, but the fact that they were truly in eternal life. They would truly see Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Savior of the world. And so believers today, Christians today, um, were witnesses to those greater things that are to come. And that's seeing God's presence through the witness of Jesus in the Gospels, the enduring presence of the church through history, and the saving grace of God through their personal lives. Now, Jesus promised to show his people greater things to encourage their faith in him. That's the future hope. Those greater things are the hope and that encourages us in our faith. And Jesus described himself as the son of man, widening the people's understanding of who he is and who he is not. So my question to you is, who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? Now this brings us to our response. How do we respond? How are you responding to this passage? You know, because Jesus gave up his life for us and we have committed to following him, our lives are to be marked by sacrifice as we are willing to do whatever God calls on us to do as we invest in others so that they might become disciples and followers of Jesus. You know, Jesus calls people to himself. Now, the fact that Jesus invited people into his life and allowed them to see his deity firsthand, it gives testimony to the fact that God wants to be known. God wants to be known by us. And we see clearly that those who know him, they naturally share him with others. Now, these stories that we read today illustrate that people who have a relationship with Jesus, each of these individuals came in to know Jesus in a personal way, they naturally tell others that he is the promised Messiah. And they participate in sharing this good news with the whole world. So just let me ask you, what joys are you experiencing from sharing with others the good news of Jesus at the Messiah, as the Messiah? What joys might you be experiencing? And you know, the people here in John chapter one, they modeled the way that Jesus also changes and transforms the human heart. Notice the response, we have found the Messiah. Now this type of praise comes from a heart that has been transformed and one that knows firsthand that Jesus really is who he says he is and came to do what he said he would do. And 
we also should have a heart of praise and that should be our response when we come into a relationship with jesus our natural response is to share him with others because we've seen jesus revealed in the bible god has revealed the truth of jesus to our heart so our lives in response should consistently proclaim that we have found the messiah to anyone who will listen we are saying to others, come and see this Jesus that I know. So the question is, do you, do you view sharing the gospel as a privilege? Do you sh view sharing Jesus as a privilege or do you see it as a dreaded duty? And you know, the first followers of Jesus brought other people to Jesus. In fact, they didn't waste any time inviting other people. They didn't waste any time to say, come and see the Messiah. So how will you use your influence this week to invite others to follow Jesus? And in summary, to restate our session in a sentence, Jesus invited his first followers into relationship with him and promised that they would experience great things. The Messiah invited others to follow him. The Messiah revealed his identity by his power and the Messiah promises greater things to come. And if you don't know Jesus, I'm personally inviting you. Come and see this Jesus that I know and that I am in a personal relationship with. You know, Jesus came into the world to call sinners to repentance and to lay down his life on their behalf so that they might be saved. Likewise, as his followers, we tell others about Jesus and call on them to turn from their sin and to trust in Jesus. Will you do that today? And just rereading our response here, because Jesus gave up his life for us and we have committed to following him, our lives are to be marked by sacrifices. We are willing to do whatever God calls on us to do as we invest in others so that they too might become disciples and followers of Jesus. Let me pray for you. Lord God, we just praise you, Lord Jesus. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You are the Savior. You are the King of Kings. Lord God, just cause us, let us just find, let us experience just the joy of sharing you with others. But help us to see that as a privilege. And Lord God, just help us to avail ourselves to you. Use us, Lord God, to invite everyone we know and encounter to just come and see. And Lord God, those who don't know you, Lord God, draw them to you. Draw them to come and see. Amen. I will see you next week um, right here. Um, same place, same time. Continue in your discipleship, your devotional study time this week. The Savior is our sacrifice. Next week, Unit 19, Session 6. And you all have a blessed week. We also meet in person at 9 a.m. at 2131 8th Street here in Sacramento if you want to come and join the conversation around the lesson. We also invite you to um, join us for worship at 1030. And also this week, Thursday, April the 6th, we also invite you to join us for our Monday, Thursday worship service here at St. Andrews at 2131 8th Street here in Sacramento. If you're in the area, come on by. We'd love to worship with you. You all have a blessed week. Oh, <laughs>